Now we begin with absence of violence deeds. They are not included, for example. There is no bloodshed on the stage. As we talked this uh, before and last week as well, uh, you cannot see any blood when someone, maybe the main or major characters are uh, killed on the stage. You cannot see any blood or violent actions as well that happen off stage that mostly happen off the stage and the messenger brings news of it. So the messenger comes to the stage and tells the audience that uh, assassination, for example, or killing someone or major or minor character is being killed off the stage, tells the news of it. There is also plausibility of plot and action as well. The plot of a tragedy should be relevant to the world, to the life we said as before, we live in. The tragedy should deal with action that has happened or might happen. Tragedy is, as we talked before, it is an imitation of life, first of all. The plot comes from real life of the play. And life consists of action. Generally, Greek tragedy takes its plots from saga, just pay attention, and legend. So, many old uh, tragedies took their plots from saga or legends. Anything happening in the plot should either be necessary or likely. The things a character says or does should follow each other. There must be a sequence of events, as we said, because the main idea in the plot is the sequence or the chains of events following each other. So, if there is no any sequence or uh, serial or series of action, in a play, in, sto uh, in, novel, in the novels, in the uh, poetries or dramas, we cannot talk about plot of the play or novel or something like that. For example, there should be cause and effect relation. I talked this before last week as well. There must be a cause. What's the reason why Macbeth uh, why was Macbeth killed, for example? What's the main reason? What made him? What caused him kill? And effect. What happened in the end, for example? So, this is a relationship. Cause and effect relationship. Mostly uh, done in the tragedies. A plot should start, as we said, there must be a beginning and develop whatever is happening during the play out of itself. So, there must be a dynamism, let's say, in tragedy. It cannot be stable. Aristotle is, I have uh, talked this again uh, last week, Deus Ex Machina. He is against Deus Ex Machina. And it is written in your paper as well, that copy that. It is a first of all a device. What kind of a device? It is a device to solve the plot. When the plot is stuck, cannot be understood by the audience, and it doesn't follow more, and there is no any solution. The actor who played the part of a god, some actors played also the part of a god, comes to the stage with a mechanical device. It comes from up to the, onto the stage, and it is used to solve plots which are so complicated that 
Only a God can solve them. Just remember from our mythology lessons last term, gods and goddesses had supernatural powers. So they can solve anything that human beings cannot. Because human beings don't have such powers as you can imagine. So the actor in, guy, in disguise of being a god, whoever uh, he is, comes to the stage from up to the down and as he is a god, he is able to solve the problems that the plot cannot follow further. It was also employed for other effects. So the use of Deus Ex Machina had another uh, effect, such as to foretell the future, predict the future of a character, give some ideas, or some idea, anyway, to the audience, or to interpret an action for the audience interrupt <coughs> and gives an interpretation to the old audience for an action being an authority so we can easily understand that that uh, main character in disguise of being a god as i said before has some power so the audience is relieved can easily interpret that he will solve the problem that uh, plots cannot go further. So these are the three unities of uh, that uh, mostly Aristotle used in his uh, old Greek plays. I am sure you, uh, you are following me uh, very clearly. And as I said uh, before, if you have any problems with understanding with uh, not getting any idea you may just send me message or messages through OBS and I will try to explain a bit more but in our previous lessons as I told you before that you must get ready prepared for each lessons that you are having from your uh, each teachers so if you just read a bit more and try to understand briefly not wholly and with my explanations I am sure you will uh, get used to you will easily understand uh, about our lessons now let's go on with character as well of course, there are some uh, points that we must mention for character too. The first one is economy of roles. Who are going to play, for example. Originally, in early tragedies, pay attention, there was one character and a chorus. We talked about the importance of chorus in my previous lesson. Chorus uh, gives more information before the play starts. What do they do, for example? They give, they interpret, they enlighten in a way the audience, because at that time the audience was so illiterate. They loved watching plays on the stage, but they didn't have good education. So the importance of chorus comes from that point. So, in the early tragedies, pay attention, there was one actor and a chorus. Later, with other uh, dramatists, Euripides, for example, I just remember, with them, of course, drama improved and uh, the number of actors were on the stage. So the number of 
uh, actors increased in a way. As there were few actors, some played double parts. So, in our Turkish movies, you can easily see as well that in our uh, dramas, for example, Turkish dramas, one character can play two characters, for example, or three characters, for example. So, since there was a lack of actors at that time, some actors played double characters in a way. They used masks, pay attention, and the chorus, again, pay attention, filled the spaces between exits and re-entrances. In a way, in a short way, you can easily understand between intervals, as I talked to you in our uh, last uh, lesson. So, the actor comes off the stage and he changes his uh, clothes, for example. He reads his texts again, gets ready for the next part of the action. So, during that time, chorus comes to the stage and give some more information to the audience and audience is enlightened again. So between exits and re-entrances, you can easily say between intervals. So the economy of roles is that since there is an absence of more characters, more, let's say, uh, actors on the stage, there were a few during the early tragedies. One main actor played double characters, double parts of the characters. So this is called economy of roles. Now, when we come to the character, for example, tragedy is not the imitation of people, but as we said, of life not only of life, emotions of people, for example, at that time. Happiness and unhappiness, for example. Action comes out of character. Pay attention. Action comes out of character because character plays the action. Not character out of action. Not through action to the character. That is in tragedy, in order to have action, we have characters. Character comes in as secondary to action. So the action is in the front, most important thing, and the character makes it, makes the action important. In tragedy, the character must experience a change of fortune from good to bad. And this must create pity and fear in the audience. As we talked before, in all tragedies, there must be pitiness, fear, death. And the audience will easily understand those elements will occur, will happen in the end of the play. So the audience is ready for the death, for the end of tragic hero. Men are generally full of pity and fear. These feelings are harmful to us. When we watch a tragedy, we are purged of purgation, just remember. These emotions, watching the downfall and death of a tragic hero, we reach a point where we do not feel only pity or fear for him. That makes catharsis because we feel that how he is above these emotions. In order to arouse pity, to make pity and fear, there must be certain qualities in a play.